The XY Advisor podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. XY Advisor does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ben Nash here. I'm a co-founder at XY Advisor and founder of financial advice business Pivot Wealth. My business baby I started from scratch a bit over six years ago. In that time, I have leveraged some of the learnings of the XY community to scale the business and become one of the better known financial advice businesses for high income accumulators. You can join me each Tuesday as I have the privilege of interviewing some amazing people where I'll sell Obviously, be able to uh, continue my personal journey to improve every aspect of my advice process, and hopefully, you can learn a few things on the journey as well. Jump over to xyadvisor.com if you haven't signed up already to share and learn from other advisors, or simply download the app. This series is brought to you by Hub24, one of Australia's leading providers of integrated platform technology and data solutions to the wealth industry. By working with licensees and advisors, Hub24 is delivering innovative solutions and service excellence that enables you to do business your way, creating efficiencies for your business and value for your clients. These are just some of the reasons why advisors have rated Hub24 number one for value for money and best managed portfolio functionality six years running, empowering better financial futures together. Find out more at hub24.com.au. Hey guys, Ben Nash from the XY Advisor team and today I'm here with Christian Zuza. Christian is a financial advisor and partner at Peak Wealth Management based out of Sydney. Christian, thanks for joining us, mate. Happy to be here. Thanks very much for the invitation, Ben, and everyone in the XY network. Well, I, I had your partner in crime uh, on the podcast like way back when. I think you guys were, it was about six months into kicking off the business at that time. And uh, yeah, we had a great chat. I'm keen today to talk about how things have changed since then. We were just having a little bit of a chat offline and it's funny, you know, when you start an advice business, you have a bunch of ideas. Uh, some of them are really great ideas. Obviously, we think all of them are really great ideas at the start, but then reality comes in, you know, we pick up a, lo- a bunch of lessons and learnings on the way. So I'm keen to hear about some of the things that have changed and, and some of the things that, that maybe haven't. But I thought maybe a good place to start was if you could just for anyone that's not familiar with uh, with yourself or uh, or Peak, um, give us a, the short version of your advice journey and how you've ended up where you are today. Awesome. So a little bit about, I guess, my self-advice journey, uh, my background and, and studies actually started in tax and specializing in accounting. Um, a former boss of mine actually told me in the advice space uh, many, many years ago. And look, I haven't looked back since. I really found it fascinating. I'm a big people person. For anyone that does know me, I'm always down to have a chat and I do actually enjoy learning from people, um, finding out about their experiences and, and sharing mine as well. Um, and advice is a really good base and platform because we're always dealing with people um, and, and I guess from our point of view, helping them navigate what's going forward. Um, Peak Wealth Management, we are, as you mentioned, Sydney based. Uh, we've got clients all over the country now, which is pretty exciting. Um, we are what's called a holistic financial advice business. We do look at uh, all the different areas of people's financial affairs and ultimately help find poor, busy professionals navigate the waters of what is their financial life. Uh, living in Sydney in particular, uh, people aren't getting any less busy as time goes on. Mm. So we feel if we can help free up people's time and help them make educated decisions on an ongoing basis, that they're going to be better off in the long run. Absolutely. And I think uh, Sydney is one of those places where people get paid pretty well, but living well isn't cheap and people making good incomes, but feeling much poorer than they they feel like they probably should or be more than they actually should. So uh, there's definitely plenty of market there. Tell me, four, almost four years uh, into business, what have been some of the biggest changes for you guys? The biggest changes, and I know you uh, touched on it very, very 
quickly in the introduction was, uh, I guess, the, the ideas of what you think is going to be the perfect business when it first takes off or it's in the early stages to, to what the reality or what is most effective for the people that you work with um, is, is a big difference. For us, one of the key changes that really helped us move forward was getting more specific in terms of the people that we work with mm. uh, from, from a, I guess, from a, a client um, side of things, instead of being all things for all people, it was more, we wanted to, we, we spent a bit of time and it, it's difficult for advisors to take that step back sometimes and really focus on who are the people that we believe we can add the most amount of value to who are the people that are in that for us it's yeah time poor professionals or business owners um in in, in different fields and different areas typically between that 25 to 45 year old space uh, i'm in that space myself i enjoy having the conversation with people ar- around my age groups above and a bit younger as well um we found there was a huge gap in the in, in that space and and there's a lot of people unadvised in that space and we feel if we can get in early um, by the time we're talking about retirement strategies um, we're already in a good position instead of starting the conversation at 60 or 65. Absolutely I remember when I was talking to Andrew on the podcast this it must have been just after the business started and uh, I was I, one of the questions I asked him was who are the people like who do you serve who are those people and were saying that like a lot of businesses do in the early days it was just basically everybody working with some retiree clients some younger clients some business owner clients some smsf clients some other clients and i uh, i said to him offline i was like man it's it's going to be hard to to drive efficiencies in your business when you're trying to do that because all of those different client groups they they it's sort of you need to follow a slightly different process and you've got slightly different moving parts that you need to consider and it means that it's really hard to to be efficient there which means that you either need to charge like a lot for your services or you you charge a, a same the same rate as a specialist but it ends up being tons more work and tons more time for you so i get that it's scary to, make sure to cut people out of the market but what's been the impact for you guys of, of making that shift in who you're serving so making that shift, uh, you, you just touched on the point perfectly. So for us, we've been able to really spend a lot of time, and that's probably the biggest shift as well. I guess I didn't, with what you said earlier, in terms of what's the key difference between where we are as a business now to before, if building out the processes um, to and, and systems and client experience for that target in particular has meant that from our point of view, we've really boosted referrals from existing clients. Mm. Plus, we're attracting a lot more of new business. We feel like we're delivering a lot more of a wow and proactive experience. Um, we set the expectations. We know what is going through the heads of our clients in that space as well. Mm. Uh, so it's been, it's been uh, that's probably been the biggest thing is yeah the processes and what happens behind the scenes. Not so much from what the client sees initially. Um, but it's once once the client's not involved and we're doing all the work um, to make sure we can deliver a great outcome and a timely outcome uh, and, and something that they really value as well. Mm. And I think that that point that you mentioned there about knowing what's happening inside their head, it might sound like a small thing, but it's actually a really big thing because particularly for people that haven't used an advisor before and don't know what to expect and don't know where the value is going to come from, there's a lot of sort of question marks there. Whereas when you do it day in and day out, you're helping the same people, you're seeing what the challenges are, you're seeing what the impact of overcoming those challenges are. It allows you to really craft your messages and make sure that you're highlighting the thing, becoming an expert in your customer's problem so that you can say, well, this is what normally goes wrong and this is how we help and this is what the impact is. And people are like, wow, yeah, shit, yeah, I really want that. Whereas what if you're dealing with the whole, like a different client every single day, then it's you don't get quite the the same impact of that. So I know that for us, it's that's been something that's that's been a huge help when it comes to engaging people and getting people to engage with their money and getting them to engage w- with advice. That um, yeah, that we we've got a lot of value out of. Christian, I'm keen to ask about you know everything from the outside and uh, yeah, that sort of looks like 
owning a business, you know, um, uh, this you know, great lifestyle and you set your own hours and, you know, it's all, it's all beer and Skittles, but um, I'm keen to talk about some of the challenges. What, what have been the biggest challenges for you guys on the journey so far? Biggest challenges. Uh, there's a list of them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, biggest challenges, I think touching base on shifting away from trying to be all things to all people was a big challenge for us. Um, naturally, Andrew and myself are in the game and we genuinely in this space to want to help people so i guess saying no or referring someone um, elsewhere to another advisor that might be more specialized for that particular client um, is a big challenge from a business front growing has had a set of challenges as well Um, as we take on more referrals as we're taking on more business really carving out time out of what we do face to face with a client which is why we got into the space um, to to advise clients and to, to, to advise more clients and, and help more people, you, you really need the infrastructure to be able to deliver that and deliver that well every single time. Mm. So that was a challenge in ourselves. We changed a lot of what we did. We implemented a whole new bunch of processes. I know we had multiple whiteboard sessions where we actually just blocked out days or half days at a time where we were jumping up on whiteboards and we're going through step by step, start to finish. Okay, this is what the process needs to look like. What tool can we use to help us add efficiency so we don't just have to charge the clients more money? Uh, What can we do on our end to to keep it a cost-effective and a mutually beneficial relationship as well? Mm. Ultimately, if we we can't get that balance right, then um, either party's not going to ultimately benefit and one of us, yeah, if, if mm. we're not charging appropriately, we won't be around as a business. And if we're charging too, too high, then clients might miss out on getting, I guess, a good service and the benefits that comes with being, being an advised client. So technology was a bit of an issue. We, we feel like we've overcome quite well. The other one now that we're seeing on the horizon, very it's uh, creeping up very, very, very quickly, is staffing. So I guess mm. our goal is if we can get, if we can make sure we've built out our system, built out the business correctly, we can have a conversation with uh, potential staff, future partners, whatever that conversation is going to look like um, for the for the next people to join the business so that they, they can really achieve and that they can really excel in their careers as well. Uh, I guess another part of our goals is uh, the last few years, um, we've seen advisor numbers drop, which short term as a business owner it's quite good because we've had no shortage of clients and working with people but if we look at it from an Australian's point of view we there's going to be people that are going to be left unadvised which Mm. is not good Um, we want to see more people doing well feeling in control of their finances and their money and being confident with what life after work or during work or finding that balance looks like Mm. Absolutely, yeah. It's uh, the tech piece is a, is an interesting one. That there's so much there, and it's it's a huge moving target, and it it still blows me away as an advisor. I know that there are a lot of great solutions out there. We use a number of them, but the amount of money that we spend on our tech, it just seems <laughs> crazy to me that there's not a, a silver, silver bullet solution. Maybe I'm just expecting too much, but I think it it sort of talks probably to the fact that every business is a little bit different. What people think is important is a little bit different. So it means that, you know, there's no like one tech fits all type approach, unfortunately. Christian, how have you guys approached team so far, building your team, setting up your team? Because for me, I've found that, as you said, to be one of the biggest challenges. And we were just chatting a little bit offline and it's sort of like you start being an advisor because you like helping people. You start a business because you know, you want to do things a little bit differently or um, you don't want to have a boss or whatever the, the motivations are. It's generally not because you want to build a team or, or grow a team. What have you guys done so far? So, so far, great question. Yeah, absolutely. That That's probably one of the challenges as well. Um, that's not what we got into things to, to manage a bunch of people. <laughs> I guess from our perspective, we have part of pulling the business apart from a process level the, the biggest thing for us was to let go of tasks that we feel like we couldn't add any access for value to then 
for example, outsourcing. Mm. Things like um, power planning, where we still do all the research in house. We do all the, the client facing side. We do all the notes, et cetera. But actually turning what the plan, the strategy, the numbers look like into a formal advice document, outsourcing that freed up a lot of our time. But then we've also looked at, um, so yeah, currently we're at five full time um, employees part of the business. So we have also looked offshore as well in terms of being able to have a team overseas uh, to, to help us with, with day-to-day steps. And, and, and again, that ties back to mapping out the business and being very clear on what we need, having good processes. And uh, yeah, as you mentioned, um, narrowing down the, the type of client that you target at least, uh, we're mm-hmm. always going to end up with clients outside of the scope, but um, that's, how, that's how we've really gone about it. From a what I can see is the next 12 months conversation is going to be about new advisors. So we're focused, the big focus of staffing was, okay, if we can't get ourselves right first, if we can't manage mm. for Andrew and myself, if we can't manage what we're doing well, then and we don't have a good process, a good system in place that doesn't rely on us being 100% engaged and doing every little bit and piece along the way, Mm. then we can't expect to hire someone um, and expect them to do it better. So that was the, that's been a bit of our focus, shifting it from, from that perspective. For us, I was fortunate uh, in some ways that I, I wrote my now wife into the business when I was a year in and she didn't come from a background in financial planning. And so because she didn't know, you know, financial services, financial advice, the compliance around that, it really forced me to get crystal clear on the processes and how it all fitted together. Uh, I did that because I didn't want to bring on other team at, at that time, but um, it sort of looking back afterwards, it forced us to create that consistent process, which then did make things a lot easier when it came to bringing other people in to, to pick things up, but basically no assumed knowledge, you know, consistent process for all of the things to work. But um yeah, I think that engine room piece and, and getting the things happening behind the scenes is really important so that when you've got an advisor comes in that they don't just have to figure it figure it all out uh, on the fly and you can get, at least give a, a, a process as a starting point that um, that people can follow without, yeah, as you say, you guys having to be drivers or involved in every single element. So uh, that makes a lot, a, a lot of sense. 100%. And um, it, the other the other piece is just the the quality control that that brings. Mm. That's probably the I guess the, a, a big fear that a lot of advisors have. Chatting to different advisors, I'm I've had a lot of people in the advisor network. A lot of really good friends that are advised at different companies, self-employed employees, etc. I guess a, a fear of any business owner who spent time building something up, your reputation is on the line as well. Mm. With every interaction, you always want to do a great thing. That, having that engine room and the process is built to a certain way means that every client gets a consistent experience. It helps manage the quality as well. Absolutely, yeah. And I think that as much as uh, there's some things that happen behind the scenes that don't actually have that much impact on advice, you get a... Um, a date of birth wrong or, you know, an address wrong or someone's name wrong. Like it doesn't actually sort of matter when it comes to your advice, but these things that they can chip away at the client's confidence in what you're doing. And uh, I've, I've certainly been in the situation before where a few little things have happened and then they add up and then the client's going, well, if these small things are happening, what else is happening that that I, I'm not seeing? And uh, that that's really inconsistent, as you say, a lot of reputational risk that, that comes Correct. along with that and, and the complete opposite outcome that you actually want to be giving the people that are working with you as well. So those, those quality Correct. controls are, are, are crucial, I think, as, as your team grows. It's amazing how much we still need to do manually as much as you can leverage tech okay. and do all of these things. Uh, there's still a lot of human uh, in, in advice. Um, Correct, so, correct. Yeah. which is the beauty of it as well. It's a pain yeah. point and a beauty of it. <laughs> Absolutely. Christian, what are you guys focused on at the moment? What's what's coming up for you? Focused on, yeah, the next 12 months is going to be continue to grow. So for the, the, the biggest things we're focusing on is 
increasing our, I guess, our client numbers, revenue numbers, and um, I guess it's a few different elements to that is really starting the conversations of what the next people to join our team look like um, in terms of advisors, hopefully helping to boost advisor numbers across the industry. Mm-hmm. It, it, is, it is that. Um, on top of that, potentially always open to looking at look high quality and value add uh, joint ventures with high quality professionals. So we've got, we've got one that's working really, really well. There are great business uh, where we um, effectively provide ourselves, our advice, our framework and the the step-by-step, the way that we do things um, to deliver it to effectively accounting practice, accounting clients, which is really, really good having multiple people into a relationship with a client. So actually looking at something like that as well. How have you gone about setting that up and like how did you get started? How did you tackle things and what should anyone that's thinking about going down that path, what should they be thinking about? So okay, so there's a couple of questions. A few things for people thinking about doing it. You really want to just make sure people are clear on expectations up front. Um, it's always good to we're, – we're advisors, so we don't plan – I don't personally. I know a lot of us don't plan on best-case scenario. There's always going to be some pain points, um, communication. It's always a big thing is um, making sure that you spend the adequate time with if you're going to go down that path, educating similar like we would do to a client. Instead of educating clients, it becomes more about educating the professionals in that business. For example, this is an accounting practice. So it is spending time with the accountants, the team, spending time with them and running workshops like we would for, for clients so that they can help identify hot buttons people in need, um, where people are struggling, and, and also boost them from their career standpoint to, to broaden their knowledge as well. So that's the biggest piece of advice I could give for going down the path of any kind of joint venture. What's the biggest mistake that you think to avoid there or, or learning where things can go wrong? Fortunately, it's been good from our perspective, but I have spoken to other advisors that have gone down this path. Unfortunately, yeah, we, we leaned on network and I'm a very interested person when I talk to other people. I spend a lot of time listening. Is really getting that balance on when you're talking about revenue splits, that part I think is the biggest piece to get wrong um, initially. The advisor does a huge amount of work and we've heard about um, different kind of structures where the advisor earns less and is doing 100% of the work just because mm. it's getting referred. So it sounds really good on paper, but then in reality, it doesn't work and it doesn't last. That is what um, will be the biggest thing that I could share for anyone looking at that path. We, we don't have that issue. We, we, the, the, the partners that we've got in the joint venture, ST Wealth, they're really they understand the advice process. So that was really helpful. Um, mm. And they really truly value advice. That's probably a, the, the big thing. Um, so, yeah, we were able to come up with something that was very fair from the beginning. I think it's just like if you're, if you're charging people, if you're not charging enough to your clients, you end up in a difficult spot where it might look like you're doing good revenue. But if the time is not stacking up, then you're just going to end up resenting doing the work because – it's not working commercially for you. So that's a really, really good tip. And I think it's easy to get caught up in the allure of, oh, yeah, I'm going to get all this business and all of this work, which sounds great. But if the commercials don't add up, then it's not likely to be sustainable and you're probably setting yourself up. 100%. 100%. Um, yeah, that's a good one to avoid in, in, in all kind of business practice. And it is a tough one as well because, yeah, on, on paper, look, things like that can look really, really good on a spreadsheet as a lot of advisors will come back to. Um, but we do have to put our business caps on and um, yeah, just work out what our time's worth as well. And um, like I said, you don't want to resent anything um, <laughs> like that, especially there is there are people on the other end of that resentment. So we want to avoid that at all costs. Absolutely, yeah. And I think it's the same, it's the same as if you're, um, again, with, with clients, if you're sometimes, and I, I, I've personally done this in the past, that you uh, charge less for clients like at the front end of your relationship being invested in building a relationship over time and sort of figure that you're you'll get your um, 
you know, you get your profit in later years. I know that that used to be a pretty typical model for the advice industry, but what happens then if someone's circumstances change and you don't end up working together for the period that you're expecting, then you've done all of this work and then someone walks away and, you know, again, you get that resentment there, whereas we want, that was a lesson for us early on and now we charge appropriately such that we know that, you know, if a client works with us for a really long time, then it's probably going to be more profitable because we end up understanding each other and working together more efficiently and all those sorts of things. But we do things in a way that if if something changes in six months' time or 12 months' time or two years' time and we don't end up working together uh, for the amount of time that we both expected at the start, then we've charged appropriately for the for the work that we've done over over that period as well. So I suppose there's a lot of sort of similarities between that and how you work with your partners or doing any sort of formal joint venture as well. Exactly, exactly. Uh, yeah, 100% to all of those points. Christian, my last question for you, and thank you so much for sharing your insights. Um, if you could go back to your day one self in the business and do one thing differently, what would it be? Good question. It's a very, very good question. Probably get more social from the beginning in terms of utilizing social media. I'd have mm. to say, um, in terms of just doing more videos. Um, and looking back at it, I'd likely share more case studies. Um, obviously, blank out all kinds of names and those things. That's something that really dawned on me recently. Um, I have a client of mine, really good uh, income earner, IT and sales space, and he's like, you yeah, know, if you shared this, with, like he, he came on board, but if you shared this with me earlier on, do you know how? Do you understand how many more people um, would be confident in making that kind of first step, um, mm. which is good? So that that's probably what I would do. Outside of that, when I first started, probably go and squeeze in one holiday as well before COVID came through. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, but no, look, I, I I think yeah, day one, just get used to. I'm finding it strange at the moment talking without video. Um, like it, it's typically with a with a client interaction, I do a lot. I do it's more active listening, um, mm. where we're 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 making sure that we ask the right questions to get the answers to get the clients to articulate what they want. I think mm. we do a lot more listening. I'm a I'm a people person, so I always find it easier chatting to people. So I think by and you do this really well having having videos yeah videos out. I think is going to be something that um, I'm going to have to make sure that. I put into my schedule and block out time and make sure that I stick to it. Yeah, I've found for, for us that it it sort of allows people to self-select quite well into your philosophies because there's a lot of different ways to be right when it comes to money. And, you know, you no doubt you deliver a great outcome for your clients, but you do it in your own way. And a lot of advisors do do it differently. For us, I've found that we put so much content out that when people come to us, it's because they go, well, we've seen all this stuff we connect with that message. That makes sense. That's the way that we want to tackle things and it makes the conversation a lot easier as well. Um, yep. But it, there's so much there. Uh, and, you know, as a business owner, we wear a, a lot of hats. So, again, like you say with your advice process, that you need to create that uh, to make it work. It's the same with with all those other elements as well. So uh, I look forward to Why seeing not? those. Yeah, it should be. Well, I've definitely done a, quite a few over the years, but I think consistency is key. Same as mm. we, we train our clients in the same way, doing the right things over a long period of time. They call my other advice when it comes to money. It's just my brain is not a <laughs> marketing brain. It's just not the mm. hat that I thought that, it, that I was in aware when we, yeah, when we stepped into being an advisor <laughs> many, yeah. many years ago. Awesome, mate. Well, look, thanks again. Really appreciate you sharing your uh, your insights and learnings. And it's great to see you guys continue to kick a bunch of goals. Uh, it's been so much progress since the last time we we got you guys on the podcast. So I'm uh, I'm, I'm pumped to get this one out there, and I'm, I'm also pumped for the next conversation to see where things are. Awesome, mate. Thank you very much for the invitation. I look forward to seeing you soon. <laughs> <laughs>